The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Key Components of Positive Behavior Support, presented by Shirley Swope. Unfortunately, Kiki was overbooked and won't be presenting today. My name is Pam Christie, PTI Director at Peak Point Center. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. If you are connected to today's webinar through the internet, you should use your attendee interface or control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your own computer's desktop. By default, you are listening in to today's webinar using your computer speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone and the audio pane of your control panel and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions in the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and I will be monitoring the questions and will address them as we go. Handouts are available for download in the handout window, and there are two of those, a PowerPoint and then an, a brochure. As you leave today's webinar, you will receive an evaluation survey about the presentation. We would appreciate if you would take just a minute to complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email very soon with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So again, welcome to today's webinar, Key Components of Behavior, Positive Behavior Support. It's my pleasure to introduce Shirley, who will take it from here. Thank you, Pam. And welcome to today's webinar. Today, we hope this webinar will help you uh, understand the benefits for um, positive behavior support for um, students and building that partnership with schools and how you can use the plan and techniques at school and home to have that um, segue from one environment to the other environment. So some acknowledgements here. Um, Kiki used information from the multi-tier family, school, and community partnering from the Colorado Department of Education. They have great information on CD's website on MTSS or multi-tier systems of support. Uh, Dr. George Sagai, who is a founder and wonderful um, proponent of positive behavior. Uh, supports and Peak Parent Center and APBS Family Ad Hoc Committee, of which Kiki is a member. So, family partnerships with schools and communities uh, to implement the positive behaviors, interventions, and supports, or PBIS. No matter how skilled the professionals are, nor how loving families are, each cannot achieve alone what parties working hand in hand can accomplish together. When you think about it, you know, children are um, beholden to parents and to schools, to all the adults in their lives to help them become the adults they need to be. It's not a um, one, parents don't raise their children alone and schools don't teach their children alone. It really is a partnership and when we recognize that we can really do some wonderful positive things for kids. Whoops. Um, families are critical players in the important work of schools. If it weren't for families and children there would be no schools. So schools have to you know, and do recognize the importance of families as um, that schools serve. Family, schools serve families and children. The product is the education that we want children to have, but the two of us together are forming adults and we're working together. And um, Rick DeFore and his colleague Robert Aker 
who are known for developing schools across this professional learning communities, they really recognize that, you know, it's, it's something that we have to do together. Positive outcomes for family school partnerships is, has proven that there's higher academic achievement, higher academic success. It improves um, behavior, greater teacher satisfaction, and increased family engagement. Because schools that do not engage families are not successful schools. So the Colorado Multi-Tier Systems of Support, or MTSS, a website has a lot of information that's really, really useful for families. That multi-tier systems of support um, is kind of a layered thing. You, the universal is all students, all families. When they come to the school, we're going to have, you know, good instruction for all students for all families, then there's going to be some uh, targeted students and families who need additional supports. And then the intensive part is a few students and families will need that more directed and more intensive um, supports. So some of the components of positive behavior support across the homeschool and environments. When we look at a child, the child exists in home, in the community and school. We have to look at the total child's and the total child's environment, not just in school alone or at home alone or uh, at the basketball game or in church alone in the community, but it is something that overlaps. And for a child, they don't distinguish like adults do between environments. So we have to really consider this approach across the board for children. And we, you know, why is it important that families understand the components of positive behavior support? Because positive behavior support planning it really does address behaviors across the board and in different settings. We recognize that children don't exist in one setting alone without the interaction of the other parts of that child's life. In family-centered practices for behavior, it's going to be more effective when there's consistency. We know that and it just um, it's just a given fact that significant people in a child's life have a significant impact. And the more we can coordinate and the more we can be consistent across the board, the more successful the child is going to be. So it's important to develop an understanding of these principles that, you know, all of us at times encounter challenging behaviors, parents and teachers alike. And behavior really is an expression of communication of some unmet need, especially with young children. And when we can identify those specific behaviors that we're concerned about, then we can look at how we can change the environment for the child, how we can change the interaction with the child so the child can have more control over their behavior. So we need to increase the likelihood that behavior that we find acceptable is going to occur because we've reinforced it and we've taught the child this is you know this is what we are looking for and this is how you're going to get that positive um, interaction with us so why do we need it at home and school we want to prevent the challenging behavior before it occurs we we just don't want it to happen and we want to make it in a way, we want to make the environment in a way that it doesn't have to happen because we're meeting the needs for the child. And when we do, we're going to teach a new behavior instead of the challenging behavior. And then we're going to reinforce that behavior. So how do we do that? We start by creating a strengths profile and we identify 
then we go to identify the setting events or what sets up a child to set them off. And then the antecedent or triggers, what sets off this challenging behavior, and then the consequences. So the ABCs of behavior, the antecedent behavior and consequence. And is the, con you know, when we look at the consequences of a challenging behavior, what is the child getting from that? And why did the child choose to have that kind of behavior to get this kind of consequence? So when we're doing that, we're looking at, you know, the underlying function of the behavior. You know, why are they doing it? So if the child is whining, oh, maybe the child wants to be picked up. And so you say, oh, I think you want to say up, please. So we're teaching even with little children, young children, we can teach them uh, strategies. We can teach them ways to get that need met. And then we teach that replacement behavior. Good talking. I understand that you want up. Good talking. Thank you for talking. And we change our response or reaction to the challenging behavior. So to meet uh, this child, families can create a strengths profile and you can share it with the school. So you can be, you know, preschool all the way through high school. <laughs> you can do this. Principles are the same. Um, things my child really enjoys and does very well. Things my child finds rewarding and motivating. And sometimes parents have to think about this a bit. Um, my child's favorites, books, movie, sport, video game characters. Sometimes your child's favorite is a dedicated time with you as a parent alone without distraction. So for 15 minutes, you're, I am yours. And I'm going to read you a book. I'm going to do whatever it is. We, we're going to talk together. We're going to play a game together. But I am yours. That dedicated time for a child can be a really strong motivator for a child. And then a strategies you know that you work that work for your child. You know, well, if it's five o'clock, he's hungry, so don't ask him to do something before dinner or a snack because it just won't get done. So, in educators, you can think about the strengths of the child in the classroom too. You know, when you look how they work with others, when you look where their interests lie, when you look when they're engaged, um, you can notice that too and think about how you can use that. Is there a favorite author, TV show, or sport? You know, what's their interest? What's the hook to keep them at school? Um, my son, when he was in high school, had an IEP, but his hook was woodshop. He really liked woodshop. And that was a hook that we used to really keep him engaged at school at times. Um, what kind of free choice activities do they like doing? When my son was younger, um, we wrote a contract for him and it included some computer time after lunch. So it was a motivator for him to get his work done. He got his work done in the morning, then right after lunch, he could have five minutes of computer time. It was a big draw for him and it worked. The ABCs of life struggles, that setting the antecedent or that setting up event. If you know you're gonna have trouble, it's five o'clock in the evening and you're going to the grocery store and everybody is hungry and tired, that is an antecedent for disaster for a lot of kids. And what happens? What sets them off? I'm hungry. I'm seeing all this food and you're not feeding me. I want to go home and eat. So I'm going to let you know about it. And often all of us have experienced those grocery store, you know, scenes when it just was a set off and the, the child cries. And the behavior is, get me out of here. Get me out of here. And the consequence is, okay, we're leaving right now if you can't behave yourself. Well, that's exactly what I want. Let's get out of here. So the payoff is the consequence. What's the payoff for the, the child at that time? Students will do the same thing. I can't do math. I'm going to be embarrassed if you talk, ask me to do something in math. So I'm going to misbehave. So I get kicked out of math class. That way 
I won't be called on to do anything in math. And it got me out of there. That's the payoff. If I misbehave enough, the school's going to call mom. She's going to pick me up. That's exactly what I want to happen. I got to get out of here. So the payoff, what is the consequence? What is the payoff? What is the behavior? ABCs, antecedent behavior consequence. So those setting events might look like this. It might be something that we don't have a lot of control over at that distal or we just don't, we don't know. It's not right here, right in our face, but it's a build up to something. Sometimes it's the daily schedule. We're too hectic in the morning. I don't know what we're gonna do at school. We're gonna have a different teacher at school. That makes me anxious. Uh, predictability of routines. What's today? What classes do I have today? Or, you know, are you going to pick me up early? Are you going to pick me up late? What? Who's going to pick me up? Differences in temperament and personalities, those social relationships that we don't know what happens on the playground or standing in line. Um, sometimes medical and physical issues really have a big role in that. Um, and challenging family situations. They carry over into school. If mom and dad are in the midst of you know, separating or some, or grandma just died and everybody's really sad, that's gonna affect me at school. Some others are, um, you know, when, when do we, uh, changes in the environment and stressors at home, that's, that can be a trigger, you know, time of our activities. What am I supposed to do? I don't understand this. What, clean your room? I don't even know where to start. I don't know how to do that. Do my homework. I can't do it. I can't remember. I didn't get it at, when we were doing it in class. How can I do it by myself at home? I can't do that. So, you know, a lot goes into this whole concept of what creates those antecedents or what creates that behavior or that challenge. So consequences are our responses. How do we how do we respond to challenging behaviors? How are we responding to our child at home? What tone are we using? What's our stressors? You know, when are we yelling? When are we getting upset? Um, and do we all respond the same way? Is one parent very calm and gets quieter as they get more stressed? Is the other parent very reactive and gets dynamic and emotional as they get stressed? Um, and staff, do they respond the same way? Do you have a teacher who is my way or the highway? Is that another teacher who's very flexible and will work with you? Um, how does it work? When you really look at your behavior and your challenges in your own behavior and how you respond to things, then you're going to see some similarity probably in the way your child is responding to something. So it's best to look in the mirror when you're looking at um, behaviors and your child's response to behaviors. Um, Kiki and I have worked together for many years and we would do parent trainings. And it was, if, if you want to teach a child aggressive driving, drive aggressively. If you want to teach a child to respond um, quietly, respond quietly to crisis yourself. So how you present and how you respond is the, what you're teaching this young person. So what are those underlying functions of behavior? Well, it's to get or obtain something, tension, an activity, you know, something makes me feel good when I do this. And so that could be one aspect or is to, to get it or something or to escape something. You know, I can't do it, get me out of here. This really makes me nervous. I don't wanna do this. I need to move away from this. And then the whys of behavior. As you look at this chart, you can see, you know, if we can kind of define it into, um, are we escaping or are we getting something? 
and is it for you know what different reasons it might happen so um so negative and positive so maintaining consequences you know what do they get or they get to or avoid is it for attention or social reaction is it you know a change in activity or routine is it increased assistance from adults and peers you've got to help me do this i can't do this by myself access to you know i have to go to that football game i just have to i have to and um or sensory stimulation or reduction this this door is way too loud it's way too bright get me out of here i have to get away from this i can't think and um or change in the physical environment you know a loud space or movement you know you can't you can yell your lungs out at a football game you can't yell your lungs out at church <laughs> so sometimes a behavior that is acceptable in one place it's not acceptable in another place and sometimes that needs to be taught not just told once and you get it but it needs to be taught um, what do you mean we're not going? You promised. You promised Grandma was coming. What do you mean she's not coming? And sometimes you really want to, don't ask me in class. You have children who want to become invisible and just avoid any kind of negative attention. Don't ask me. I don't know how to do that. Don't ask me. You're going to embarrass me. So behavior can mean the same behavior from screaming and crying can mean many things, or from withdrawing and becoming invisible can mean many things. Um, I want you to pay attention to me. I want food. I want to play with you. I don't want to stop what I'm doing right now. Don't make me transition. I can't do that. I don't know how. I don't understand what you want. I don't have any friends. How do else can I get attention? So often, children do not understand what their behavior means so how are we have to interpret it for them they just know how they feel or the emotion of it um things to consider before a plan is the child aware or has he been taught how to how to when and where demonstrate the appropriate behavior that's a very basic question have you been taught what how have you taught this how have you demonstrated this how have you really shown him what to do often we expect children to from our negatives figure out what the positive is don't run oh then it means i need to walk we should say i really like the way you're walking because walking really demonstrates safety thank you for walking did I say anything about running? Is the child meeting a need or getting a payoff for the behavior? You know, math is really scary. Math is hard. I don't know how to do it. So my payoff is I don't have to do it if the principal comes and gets me and puts me in the office and yells at me for an hour for not, for not having good behavior in math. Payoff is I don't have to do math. Um, is the child aware he's demonstrating the behavior or has it become a habit? Sometimes behaviors at home and sometimes behaviors at school are simply a habit that's a hard thing to break. So if you have a child and at home your habit is in the morning, oh my gosh, we're running late, everybody up and kind of wild and crazy, that's a habit. That's how we act in the morning instead of really planning ahead. Um, if you're, you know, if you're loud in your family, that's a habit. So what kind of habits of behavior does this child demonstrate? Um, is this behavior, is this a necessary behavior to teach right now or is there a simple practical solution for now? So is this something that's really harmful that we, we need to stop it right this minute or can we solve the problem by changing the environment? Then we're teaching a behavior, 
we've eliminated the need for the behavior. So um, when we're waiting for something, you know, we want to play with a friend, say, please stop. You know, these are some skills that we can teach children how to do in preschool and in teachers of young children often build these kind of concepts into their lessons um, and lesson plans. So and making a choice and but this is something that we can do all the way from little bitty all the way through adulthood, <laughs> you know, and um, it's something that we as adults can work on. And when we work on it and we're real open about working on these skills that we'll be building in ourselves, we're teaching our children at the same time. Identify what challenging behavior interferes with success at home, school, and the community. You know, what does it look like? What does it sound like? When does it happen? And who's involved in the behavior when it does happen? And what do you wish your child will do instead? So when we're looking at that and we're looking at that behavior, we're really kind of um, taking, we're dissecting it. We're, you know, why is it annoying? Is it is it annoying to everybody or is it just me? Um, is it something that we need to change? Or is it something that I need to change in myself that I can accept it? Sometimes you have children with disabilities who uh, will get obsessive about a subject and you're just so tired of hearing about trains. You don't want to hear about trains anymore. No, we're not even going to you know, think about trains, something like that. Is that a behavior that's harmful to you or your student or your child? And does it need to be changed or do you need to change and accept it? And or household routines like, you know, getting up in the morning, getting ready for school, doing your homework, getting ready for bed, getting ready for dinner and taking care of your own needs. So what do your routines look like? So often a behavior will happen, repeat itself at a certain time during the day, like right before dinner, everybody's really grumpy. That's not a good time to do homework. So if you're saying, do your homework, we're about to have dinner, get your homework done. I don't want to, I don't want to. Well, it's occurring. Maybe we need to change when we do homework. Maybe we need to have a snack first, then do homework, then have dinner a little later. Mandy throws a tantrum, kicking and screaming, throwing things when I ask her to put her toys away and get ready for dinner. You know, what I want to see is that she cleans up and she gets ready for dinner. So five big questions that we look at when we're looking at behavior. Who, what, when, where, and how often? So who's doing what? Mandy screaming and having a tantrum. When, right before dinner and where at home and how often will every single day how are we going to change this when you look at it that way you can really define a, a specific you can get specific instead of just these big general ideas that nobody can handle so um, with school routines you know when you look at school routines um, especially with preschool and little kids when you're, you're teaching, but all the way through school, through middle school, through high school, elementary school, we have school routines. We have entering the school and saying goodbye to the school. And then with kids, you know, they're transferring uh, information from school to home, and usually that's in a backpack. So do we have a backpack routine when we get home? Do we open it up and we do we look at the backpack um, at school? We have, you know, we put our coat and back to pack away. We have circle time, center time. We have these transitions, taking care of our needs, asking for help meal times, and things like that. Home, we have routines too. And if you identify your home routines, you'll see some are chaotic and some are not. So depending on 
the structure of your family. It's not a right way or a wrong way. It's just how it is. So when I my children were growing up, we were pretty routine. We had a routine at home and we had mealtime and we all ate together and we had our chores that we had to do every day. And we had a routine and we had a routine for homework. So we were pretty routine. It wasn't we were checking the clock and say, OK, now it's time for that. But we were pretty routine. Um, my son in his own home now with his own children, he's much more relaxed than the home in which he grew up. So we have these routines for steps for success. What does that routine encounter when we, it's called getting ready for school? What do we do? Well, we get dressed, brush our teeth, eat breakfast, we get in the car and go. Homework. How do we do homework? When do we do homework at home? And mealtime. Do we all eat together? Do we eat all over the house? Do we have kind of hors d'oeuvres? Do, do we sit down to a whole meal? So what does that look like for your family? And it's good to really look at it so that you can dissect it and see where the behaviors are happening that you wish to change or that you wish to see changed. So helping with chores, getting ready for bed, riding the car, shopping. You know, what does that look like? Then um, when you're creating these routines, and routines are great for kids because it really helps them get grounded. It really helps them think about what's going to happen next. And it really gives them a sense of control over their bodies, but over their day also. So when we're making these routines, they don't have to be really strict. It's set in concrete and you can never do anything else because that's not reality. But it is a way for your child to be grounded. Um, then they know what to do. So be clear about, you know, new events. You know, we're going to go to, we're going to have visitors. We're going to go to the doctor. We'll go to the dentist today. Uh, we're going to go to a party, something like that. And then transition warnings are so helpful to all of us, but helpful for a child to get their head around what's coming next. Well, in 15 minutes, the TV goes off because it's time for, you know, starting to get ready for bed. Um, in 10 minutes, the TV is going off. OK, in five minutes, the TV is going off. The, OK, the TV is going off now. Oh, no, let me finish. No, no, I'm sorry, but the clock says it's time for it. So you can actually put the, you know, some things off on an object such as the clock said my son uh, if my granddaughter is using a tablet um it's time to go off and when it goes off she goes it went off and he said oh well okay it's going to sleep now now it's time for us to go on to something else so you can you can blame it on the timer or anything but it helps your child know that it's coming let your child know it's coming, and when it happens, it happens. Um, timers and visuals are great with transitions, especially with little kids, but even older kids and even adults. Uh, it's helpful for, for, the, for them because it really cements that change is coming. And here's what we're doing next. So you always want to think about those situations that set up behavior, you know, is there a change in routine? Are you tired? Do we have a babysitter coming over? Uh, then what sets it off? Asking him to turn off the TV right before, uh, oh my gosh, look at the time. Turn it off right now and let's go to bed right now. Or, you know, I can't have ice cream right now. And how does our behavior reinforce this series of unfortunate events? I told you to turn off the TV. Why are you yelling at me? Get to bed. I don't want to go to bed. Don't yell at me. Yeah. See, they're learning from your example. Um, and what's the payoff for this behavior? Sometimes the payoff is everybody is getting riled up, getting more agitated. Sometimes the payoff is 
you know, I'm going to get in the last word because I'm the one in power. So who's in control? I'm in control and you're going to know it. It doesn't work so well, but sometimes the payoff for the behavior isn't the desired result, but it's um, a very, we might get our way, but the emotion around it is not very happy. So presenting, preventing a challenging behavior is always easier than addressing it. You know, if we can just have it not happen at all, that's the best solution for all of us. And we can do that if we think ahead and if we pay attention. If we pay attention to our behavior and the triggers that antecedent the behavior and the consequence. If we can pay attention to that, those antecedents, then a lot of times, many times, we can prevent this challenging behavior, then we don't get in the habit of having challenging behaviors. So if we know what the triggers are that's gonna set up a, ch a child, we can stay away from those, those triggers. If we know that going to the grocery store at five o'clock after I picked him up from, you know, the after school care, we don't have any food, we're all hungry, but I pick him up and we go to the grocery store, I can anticipate that we're going to have hard time. So if I know that, I can go, oh, here's, here's an energy bar right here. Let's have half of this energy bar. Go ahead and eat it now. And then we're going to go to the grocery store. And when we're there, we're getting five things. And here's the list. And then we're going to go right home. So even if you still have to do the activity, you can set it up to help prevent some of those challenging behaviors if you plan ahead. Um, then if we remove temptations and things, they're likely to create the problem, you know. Just don't have it there. If you think having, you know, the chocolate cake in the middle of the table because it's pretty, but we're going to not have it today or we're not going to eat it till tomorrow, put it away. Don't have the temptation there. Um, choose activities at the time of day and places where your child can be successful. You know, we're going to go to the grocery store, <laughs> but we're going to have dinner first and then we're going to go. Or we're going to have lunch first and then we're going to go. So we're not going to go when we're tired and hungry. We're going to go with a list and we're going to go. And then after the grocery store, we're going to go straight to the park. So when you have, a, when you plan ahead, then you can plan ahead for success and not plan ahead for failure for a child's behavior. Think multi-sensory, you know, pair verbal directions with a song, a scent, a visual, especially for little kids, it helps them make that connection. Because sometimes we throw a lot of words at kids, but it takes them longer to process it, or their understanding of it is different than the meaning that we had when we said it. So when we compare it with something else, you know, it's great. It helps them make that connection. Five to one positives uh, to reinforce steps in the right direction. And this is something that is not just a feel good, you know, kids should know when they behave, they should behave. And that's it because I said it one time, you've got to teach it. And when you give behavior to the behavior that you want to see, not the behavior you don't want to see, don't run, you were running. Why were you running? I told you not to run. I like the way you're walking. Walking is safe. Thank you for walking. We can all stay together when you walk. I really like to, I like the way you walk. Thank you for walking. When you pay attention to what you want to see, not what you don't want to see, that's what they're hearing and that's what they're learning. When you say run, 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 they're running. When you're saying walk, 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 they're walking. Um, genuine, specific praise not just these general things. And a lot of times you could say, good job. And he, the kid just picked his nose. So good job picking a big one, huh? Well, good job on one. I like the way you are. 
I like the way you are doing this specific task. I like the way you're being safe by walking. I like the way you were nicely uh, talking to your friend. I like the way you helped your teacher pass out papers. I like the way you helped your little brother with it play. I like the way you played with your little brother. I like something very specific. And sometimes it's hard for us to notice that, but we've got to train ourselves to notice that behavior. And then use those positive reinforcements as much as, of, as often as possible, because that's what they're hearing, that's what they're learning. Then do something special with your child to reward and strengthen the relationship. A lot of times we neglect that adult one-on-one -on -one interaction with a child at a child's level for no other reason than just to be with them. And that's reward. You want to be with me because you like me and you're going to listen to me and you're going to talk to me and we're going to talk about what I want to talk about. That strengthens a relationship, especially for a child. And um, if your child needs more structured reinforcement system, remember the simpler, the easier it is to implement, the most likely you'll be consistent with it. So if it's like, you know, my dogs have not yet learned to put my shoes in one place and I leave them all over my floor. And since it's just me at my home now with my dogs, I have to reinforce myself by picking up my own shoes and putting them and saying, good job. <laughs> and as silly as that is, just remember the easier and simpler it is, the more consistent you'll be with it. And children learn that way too. So if your job, if you're, system at home is to take your shoes off when you enter your home. Many families do that and put them by the door, not in front of the door, not in the walkway, not just kick them off right by the door, but take them off and set them on the mat. Then we need to structure that and we need to reinforce it every time we see it or else you're walking on shoes all day. Positive behavior support is the redesign of the environment, not the redesign of the individual. The child doesn't need to change. The child can't change without help from changing the environment. And positive behavior supports ask us to change our behavior to help the child change their behavior. So when we become more consistent with putting shoes in one spot, the child will become more consistent with putting shoes in one spot. So redesigning the environment is not, oh, he needs to learn. He needs to learn how to do this. Well, he will learn, but he can learn in a positive way. And he can learn because we have taught, we've changed so that the child can change. It's that Gandhi quote, be the change you wish to see in the world. The only behavior you have control over is your own behavior that you can't I make your child behave, you can't make anybody behave until you behave. So what we wanna teach is that internal desire for getting along and for you know, supporting each other as human beings. And that comes when we demonstrate that. So PBS is really an individualized approach to having an alternative to just this, you know, punishment kind of model that we've practiced for years. It is proactive. It's proactive in teaching and um, management of behavior. So you really are going to change the behavior by teaching a replacement behavior. It can happen at school and it can happen at home. Um, so defining those expectations, arranging the environment so that they can be successful, watching out for scheduling and routines, offering choices, and kind of helping them to move into that behavior that we wish to see. Oh, remember, all of us are going to take off our shoes and put them right here when we come home. Say it every day. How do you how do you teach a child to brush their teeth every day? You say, don't forget to brush your teeth. Here, let's brush our teeth together. Here's how we do it. So you teach it, you teach it, you teach it, you teach it every day. 
and that's that. What we want to teach and teaching those skills, that's what makes the difference too. When we really understand this is the behavior that we want to see happen. So when the child comes in, kicks off their shoes, instead of yelling at them, we go, before you go in the door, where are we going to put our shoes? Let's remember to put our shoes on the mat. Good job. I really appreciate you putting your shoes on the mat. That's what we want to do every single day. And responding to the behavior. Look how you put your shoes on the mat. This makes 10 days in a row you've put your shoes on the mat. I so appreciate that. You don't stop at 10 days, though. You keep going. So um, look at what your strengths of your child are what they like to do, you know, do they have a good relationship with mom and dad? How can we improve those relationships um, with your children? Do they have good relationships with teachers at school? And this is the, the um, looking at one child's strengths. And um, how do you calm down at home? How do you, you know, can calm down? And this child is a very sweet and loving and affectionate child. So things that motivate this child are your puzzles as a reward, time with dad, likes to fish, you know. So just make a list of motivations that you find in your children at home. Um, things my child needs to work on, learning how to calm down consistently how to handle frustration and parents probably need to be main teachers in this along with teachers need to be main teachers on this so parents may be very reactionary you know and very loud so that is a way that when parents recognize that then they can work on not being so reactionary, not being so loud. So the child could learn that way too. Or, you know, um, you just have to be really clear about specific feedback and praises on behavior. So, you know, what triggers this child? Well, David's positive behavior support plan says that he really doesn't like it when somebody's in his space lining up. He likes that consistency. Um, having somebody take a toy away from them, you know, nobody likes that. Um, when transitions are less structured, when I'm, I don't know what's going to happen next and you're throwing it at me, oh, now it's time for this. Well, I don't like that. I need time to process transitions. So, you know, the problem behaviors and responses are focusing and boundaries and aggressive play and maintaining consequences, you know, that adult attention to intervene with a problem behavior and getting things back for him. So let's think about the preventions and then let's think about our new skill and the goals that we want to set up for him. So what are the strategies that we can use? And this slide kind of lists some of those. So to challenging behaviors, um, we need to redirect the child. We need to reinforce the use of feeling words to teach him these new skills so that he can put on the brakes when he's feeling um, like things are going downhill fast. Um, we can give him clues like thumbs down for inappropriate behavior on um, words and thumbs up for appropriate words. Um, we can teach them about personal space and we can say, you know, put a bubble around your body. And when there was a sign in one elementary school for kindergartners lining up and said, uh, put a air bubble, put a bubble in your mouth and hold it there. So you're not going to be talking in line, right? So there are ways that we can help them understand and reinforce the behavior that we want to see happen. Then for engaging families and um, in behavior planning process, you know, we teach, we parent as we were parented. There are not guidebooks that come out when babies are born. Say, here's the guidebook for this kid. 
just doesn't happen. We really have to create those partnerships with families, schools do, and teachers do. And because we're all equal members, equal players on this team. As parent advisor, I often hear, you know, they think I'm a bad parent at school. The school thinks I'm a bad parent. And it, parents get very defensive about that. Parents don't say, oh, I hope I have a kid that I can really screw up because I want to do a bad job parenting. And teachers don't go, oh, I want to be a teacher so I can really screw up kids and really, you know, cause trauma throughout their lives. Neither parents nor teachers, and most teachers are parents, want to have that kind of, you know, attitude or want to do harm to kids. They don't. We're on the same team. We want to create good partnerships so that we can make, help kids turn into good adults. That's it. We're all focused on the child. We need to be focused on the child and how to help that child turn into this and grow into this person that we can all respect. So it is a partnership. We may not know how to do it together. And we need to learn how to do it together. So when we can look at each other as equal players on the team and we can set up that communication between school and home, we can create something just amazing. Um, so it's a needs based. You know, what does this child need? The needs of the child, not the needs of the school, not the needs of the parent, the needs of the child. What does this child need? And then we need to take in our respect, our differences, our cultural differences, our language differences, how we were raised, and figure out how do we go forward from here to create something that can be very positive for this young person. So the more parent education programs that we can understand the positive behavior strategies, it really helps the parent learn new skills or to recognize the skills that they do have and how to enhance those skills. But also so that teachers can better understand too how this family interaction and family culture and family expectations um, affect this child. And to help the parents also to understand and to identify positive replacement behaviors. But teachers need to learn those positive behavior replacements also. And then to, for the whole team members, provide tools, contracts, checklists to reinforce the ideas that parents can use at home with the teacher. When my son was in second grade, we wrote a contract with him, the teacher and I and he the three of us wrote a contract together for him to finish his work. And she promised she wasn't going to give him any more work than he could do. And if he did it, then he would give her something. And she said, what? And he said, nothing. And she said, no, that's not how contracts go. He ended up giving her two minutes of playground time. So he had to watch the clock go around two times and then he could go out and play. And if he did his work, he was in second grade. And he, for me, I contracted to pay him 50 cents a week to go to school. So we worked on a contract, the three of us together. And he gave her two days of two minutes. So four minutes total in his whole life. And after that, he got his homework done. I mean, his schoolwork done. And he got paid 50 cents a week to go to school. So working together as a team, we came up with something that worked at home and worked at school and it worked together. And he could see that we were talking, that we were concerned about his behavior, about his ability to work, and that we both wanted to support him and that we both were engaged in this in some degree to some extent. And it worked. So when you work together, team and um, teacher and parent together, um, you can do something amazing 
because I didn't see him as a student. I saw him as my son. She didn't see him as her son. She saw him as a student. So those two perspectives were part of the same person. And we always have to remember that. So partnering with families and positive behavior, you know, please kind of check out these websites. Um, Association on Positive Behavior Support, it's a great place to get ideas and to understand the reasoning behind that. This is not a power struggle. We don't need to be in a power struggle of making sure that our child knows who the boss is and that you must obey me at all times because I said so but that it's a way of raising a child and instilling in a child a way of being as an adult that is a positive outlook in life, positive support to the community, but also in control of your own behavior. So um, PBIS, um, Home and Community PBS Network, CD Family Resources, they have a lot of information there, promising practices. Um, call us at Peak Parent Center. We're happy to talk about behavior supports and um, give you some ideas there. Center on Social Emotional Foundations for Early Learning, uh, Technical Assistance Center on Social Emotional Intervention for Young Children, and a Parenting Special Needs Magazine. There are children who really, you know, need um, some extra teaching and extra support. And because of a disability and um, that parents aren't familiar with or, you know, an extra reason and it's out there. So families are the key to positive behavior supports. And real change can only come as a result of commitments of both minds and hearts of the total school community, teachers, parents, students, administrators, and school boards. If we all work together, we can have something very positive happen um, in schools and in our homes. And Kiki's childhood hero Mr. Rogers, and he's one of my heroes too, is tempting to think a little isn't significant and that only a lot matters. But most things that are important in life start very small and change very slowly, and they don't come with fanfare and bright lights. Our behavior needs to be that way too, and when we commit ourselves to positive behavior supports and instruction for children. Those little things, those little people, those little behaviors become something wonderful and great. And we should congratulate ourselves when we see these young adults entering the world um, to be very bright lights in the future. And Kiki, that's, I mean, Kiki and Pam, Thanks. Thank you, Kiki, for putting this together. And Pam, do you want to take over now? Thank you, Shirley. Very soon, as long as all of the technology works, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of today's webinar. Please note, that version of the recording will not have closed captioning added. As soon as we are able to add captions to the webinar recording, we will post on our website under archived webinars. To request a certificate of, ple of completion, please email me at pchristy at peakparent.org. I, wrote the, I um, typed this out in the chat window. It's p-c-h-r-i-s-t-y at p-e-a-k-p-a-r-e-n-t dot org. Thank you to our wonderful presenter, Shirley, and everyone attending. If you have any questions, please contact any parent advisor at Peak. I also put this contact information in the chat window, www.peakparent.org, 719-531-9400, parentadvisor at peakparent.org. Again, as you exit the webinar, 
Please take just a moment to complete our evaluation survey as we greatly value your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email very soon with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Peak Parent Center and Shirley, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.